Adil Abidi, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you so much for joining us, man. Really appreciate it. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Uh, just it's been such a long time since I've seen your face. So it's it's so such nice a <laughs> it's such a long time. I was gonna say we actually, in an odd way, go way, 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 way back. We're talking about ten years ago uh, when I yes. used to work for a, a local community channel and I used to do a uh, a show on art and I invited you on uh, back in the days in in, in horrible Croydon uh, to come <laughs> participate and now here you are international superstar making us all uh, no no fan. no please no please not at all I remember that I was actually I think I don't know why I posted I think I may have posted it on my Facebook many many years ago and I got a memory of it I was oh, like, no oh, I think I, was that part of the Ehlo Bait it was Ehlo right? TV yeah this is yeah this is like 2000 I want to say 2010 so a very 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 long time ago is this still around back. Uh, it's still around, yeah, it's changed a lot, um, but you know, I think uh, those days were different because it was like the beginning of it, so it was just like the start of something new, um, right. and at the time, it, you know, I think what's so interesting is that at the time it, it was something so big, but now 10 years onward, when you look back at it, it it's just so small in, in comparison to, I guess, how far we, we've come, all, all three of us here. Of course. Uh, you yeah. know, and so I think it's just, it, it's so amazing to look back and, 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 and look at your journey, this journey of life that we have where, you know, we've, we've uh, evolved both in terms of, uh, you know, our crafts and our work and our life, you know, everything just, you know, it's, it's crazy where life takes, takes you essentially. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, do you ever like reflect on that? Do you, is that something you think about a lot or I, I, I know <laughs> for me, time. for me, the past is past. I try to forget it as much as possible, um, but I guess everyone has their own relationship. What, what is it like for you? I mean, I think for me, I look back at, uh, I guess, decades. I think the twenties was spent really just figuring stuff out. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't, I mean, I, I think I had a plan but at the same time, I didn't really have a plan. I was, I, you know, I did. I knew I wanted to dabble in creative stuff. Um, you know, it was my first passion was acting, and you know, I actually did pursue that for a while. And um, and then art was always something that was just there on the side. And um, it was only when you know, I think I kind of go by what people were kind of resonating with, and a lot of people were just really responding really well to my art. And then I was like, but no, that's just a hobby. You know, I want to, I want to be an actor and I want to, I want to do all those things. So it is crazy how, you know, you have a plan, but then, you know, as they say, you know, God has other plans for you. Oh. Um, so, and, you know, I'm very happy that I, I think, I think now the overlying thing is I'm just so very blessed to work for myself. And, you know, the, you know, I, I work, hard for myself i'm not working i'm not like in like a chain where you know i'm working my arts also that someone else can make more money it's just like everything is just for me <laughs> so and right. and it's and it's the life i've chosen so with the highs and the lows so i have to kind of just you know take it in my stride it's um, it, it's, it's funny you mentioned that sorry has name before you jump in it, it, it's funny you i wasn't gonna mention your your, your freelancing bro. <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't gonna mention yeah. that so i don't there's a running joke on this podcast where ali who's not with us right now me i basically transitioned to a full-time freelancer as well um so I, I was working you know you know silly right Salim's a good yes, good mutual of friend of us. so I, I was working with Salim for the Muslim vibe and then three months ago I turned around and said listen still I, I didn't say that <laughs> listen <laughs> Why I, I, no I was like I, I'm gonna transition so I've transitioned now into a full-time freelancer as well so I'm now on that first journey of my of my own like you know working for yourself and, and working on your own terms and can I ask uh, what made you make that shift because that is one of the I get asked that a lot like when did you decide to stop doing you know guaranteed income work for going into a freelance I think for me it's always been something I've wanted to do um I think like f five years ago maybe six now I, I sat down took a long look at myself and said okay what do you really want out of life and who are you really like trying to understand myself and and what works best for you um and I think we've discussed this before in the podcast so many people were great in a nine to five but me personally I just yeah. I, I can't work in such a rigid system I can't work I, I can't come in at nine and, and leave at five or, or work that job I can't um, you know, I, I need to, to have that flexibility when it comes to my life and even that sense of control. So for me, even if I was earning a bit less, if yeah. I have that same control, sense of control over my life where I can get up and travel whenever I want and, and do what I want and work for different clients and help, you know, I think it, it's one thing to live that kind of dream, but it's another thing to live the reality. So I kind of ask myself, okay, how can I benefit people now if I'm going to step into this? And what I realized was instead of uh, uh, working full time for one company, what I can do is use the the passions that I have to try and uplift as many people as I can in whatever whatever, whatever way I can. So I think there's a level of 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 selflessness and 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 I guess generosity that you have to include into that because sometimes you can be very selfish and with your time and and you know with with your craft, which I think is uh, you know a, a trap that you can fall into. Um, I'm, I'm so. Uh, yeah. 
No, sorry. I'm so glad no, go you mentioned. Ask me questions. <laughs> <laughs> go for it, please. Um, I'm so glad you mentioned uh, uh, the acting because uh, uh, and television as well. Because I, before, before we jumped on, I was watching an old clip on Instagram with Mehdi Hassan, your friend, who was uh, yeah, yeah. telling you about all your old careers. Uh, I mean, so so what was it? I mean, I don't know. It, it feels like those are very fun industries to work in, television acting, and and they're not too far off from, I guess. Uh, you know what, what you do now in terms of the fact that they, they kind of fall under art so what kind yeah. of i mean did you enjoy those industries or was it just more like you preferred um dedicating your time fully to, to what you do now um i definitely enjoyed it i mean i think i think i guess hasnane can also you know contribute to this because he's doing he's doing he's, he's done it he's doing it <laughs> um i i think and it's interesting i mean i know i was actually reading the tagline of this uh podcast i've like boulevard of the intersection of spirituality and culture and i think for me it was a I mean, the spirituality is always there, but if anything, it's a bit of religiosity and culture. Um, you know, I'm very aware of where I come from, you know, the family I come from, you know, um, you know, going even deeper, I guess some people can be very particular about, okay, you're Muslim and you're Shia and you're Satan. And I'm just like, okay, well, I'm also just a normal you know, a person as yeah. well. But I've always had these things that have always been on my mind, right? So even when I decided to um, apply to acting school, for example, you know, I had to sit down with my parents and it was a very, you know, very intense discussion of, you know, I'm not going to leave the faith. I don't think I'm going to like all of a sudden go down this path and forget to pray around the Mars and forget about fasting. And, you know, I, 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 I felt I could tackle both. I felt I could still be very true to my roots and my you know, heritage and, and respect and trust of my family, but also pursue my, my, my passion and, you know, and, and, and make it, you know, however I wanted to make it. But I felt with acting, it is much harder because you're not in control. <laughs> um, and I think with my artwork, it's all on me. Um, and um, there's, still, there's still not much control in terms of obviously, you know, people buying your work, but, you know, I, I, I definitely felt I'm able to obviously create, I'm able to, you know, com you know comp compose work myself and, and make stuff happen for myself. I think with acting, I think maybe now you can do more, but when I was doing it, there wasn't, you know, streaming wasn't really around as much over then and YouTube people, you know, videos were just starting. And It was harder to break to, into the industry. It was definitely then. harder to break in. And it's funny because now some of my friends who are in the acting industry, you know, be it here or in India, because I actually went to both, um, they're like, oh, Adil, oh, we should come back and audition for this in Netflix or Amazon or this you know, series, you, you know, you'd be, there'd be a character role that'd be great for you. Because, you know, I always was looking for character roles. I wasn't going to go there and become this Bollywood heartthrob and, you know, just dance around, prance around with girls and stuff. No, for me, it was very much, I would love to have done character-based roles, just showcasing different facets of society. And at that time, it, there wasn't, it just wasn't there. It was very much, okay, are you a famous son or do you have a famous father or you know how are you linked to the industry um and you know acting school i went to acting school in new york um and the lee strasberg method acting school I right, right. That one. so i was there Top for nice. like yeah it was yeah well at the time it was and you know i was there for a year and then i moved to india bombay and i was there for a year um, you know, did the whole grind, you know, audition, standing there with the whole thing. These are high, my name is Adela, but these are my profiles, you know, all this type of stuff, right? <laughs> in, a, in a room full of men that looked like me and trying to, you know, right, get, right. you know, try to, fingers crossed. But I definitely felt, I definitely felt stuck. I, I, I felt, you know, I don't know if I had it in me to do the long haul of just waiting around, auditioning, auditioning, auditioning. And I think with the art, and I, and I will say Alhamdulillah, um, and it's funny actually, just a segue, but you know, for me, you know, namaz and all these things, it's always like a very up and down thing, but I kind of made a, like a vow to myself. Like the day I landed in India, I was like, I'm not gonna miss a prayer. Like, I'm gonna make sure I stick to this because potentially there could be murky roads down the line and I just need to make sure that I'm doing one thing right. So um, Alhamdulillah, since then I've been so good with all, all those things, personal things for me. And, you know, I, and I do feel, you know, Yes, I may have wanted that, but you know, God still planned a way for me to have another career in the same creative form, but that was much more my own than acting. And you know, people still ask me, "Oh, would you ever go back to acting?" And I think, I don't know, I don't, maybe. But I'm not, I'm not so desperate for it like I was back then. Oh, it was, I was yeah. so like, "Oh no, this is it." And you know, now I'm much more like, "Oh, no, I, you know, I can do other stuff in my career." Yeah. <laughs> Sorry if I answered the question in the wrong. But... No, you're good. Good. <laughs> Hasnina, what about you, Has yeah, Hasnina, yeah, you, you got a point. Yeah. You're in there. Yeah. Um, so I do agree with uh, I started acting maybe nine years ago. Um, and it was basically the only way I knew how to break into the industry was literally just go to auditions, right? Open casting calls, which were the worst. 
Uh, um, <laughs> or you, if you had an agent or a manager, you'll kind of get in the door, but you have to be prepared. Like you have to get your training done. You have to have your headshots, your resumes, all, all the, and, uh, you know, you speak about, you know, being your own boss and, 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 and being a freelancer and whatnot. And I still work a nine to five. <laughs> I enjoy my nine to five. It pays the bills for me, but we don't judge you, bro. Go for it. But in, <laughs> give you the truth. <laughs> but in the in the film world, um, I felt that way where I transitioned from, hey, I'm not going to audition and, and and work for other people. I still do a little bit of that, but I'm very picky when it comes to that. But now I transition to, okay, I'm going to make my own films. Right. Um, and through that nine year journey, I made the right connections. I made the I met the right people the right cinematographers, DPs, the right people who can help me get things done. And now I'm in a point where I'm happier because I get to push my ideas and get them written and get them filmed. So I kind of see it that way in regards to like, you know, being your own boss in that term, which is great. Do you, worry so, much to, about the out, do you worry so much about the outcome as such or are you more doing it because you just enjoy doing it? Right? I, I used to worry about the outcome. It's funny because our last podcast, I spoke about how I'm currently releasing everything I did three, four years ago. Because I was just so scared to release. I don't know how you're doing it, man. I've got and, so much else to do. You know, it, it's just to, it's just to the point where um, I I am confident in my work. I know that I gave this 100, percent and I know that if 99 people think it's not good by that one person loves it, then I, it's a win for me. Yeah, that's kind of how I see it. Yeah, no, great. Continue. Leading on from that, Adil, I uh, wanted to pull up this old Instagram post. I, I'm sorry, I, I just kind of combed through Instagram. Um, no, 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 not, not, not in like a weird way, but I just wanted to like, <laughs> uh, uh, bring up some talking points. I feel like Instagram is is it, it, it is quite a facade, but it does kind of reveal, I guess, parts of of of, of people, which I think is quite interesting. Um, and I found this post that really kind of spoke to me, which is about uh, trepidation. Uh, mm-hmm. And you were talking about how uh, every time you pick up uh, a brush to start an art piece, there's always an element of trepidation. Uh, and you said, um, the trepidation I have here is that I hope I can get as close as possible to my client's vision. So like, is that, I mean, this, this was like a few years ago now, but is that something mm-hmm. you still face when you're, when you're trying to, to when, when you're commissioned to do something? Is, is there that kind of fear that still exists there? Because when Hasnaim was talking about releasing his old films, I'm just like, hey, I look back at things I've done years ago. I'm like, I'm, I hate it. I want to delete it. I wish I could erase it from existence. <laughs> and I feel like every artist has that to an element when they create something like, you know, what, it's just not good enough. And, and, and there's a fear in releasing it to the world. So, I mean, when it comes to your process, what kind of fears, does that fear specifically still exist? And, and you know, what other kind of fears exist when you're, when you're creating? Um, I think the fear is always there, I think, purely because clients come to me with a vision in their head, right? And, I, and I sometimes I think, and no disrespect to any of my clients, obviously, but sometimes they're like, kind of like, want to be artists. They're like, well, they can't do it, so they just get me to do it. And I'm just like, okay, well, look, I can definitely, you know, and, and I think a few years ago, I would very much just do whatever clients wanted me to do. And I would basically be their hands to doing it. And I think, you know, over the years, alhamdulillah, and being able to, you know, finesse my own craft and, you know, release my own kind of stuff, collections here and there. And that's something which I'm going to be doing more of going forward. I think now people have, I don't say bought into it, but now realize, oh, actually, his stuff is actually good. And let's let's base our commissions off the stuff he's done. Um, So that makes me feel a bit more comfortable because now they're not coming to me and saying, oh, we love your calligraphy, but here's a horse. Or, you know, we love your clean, here's some flowers. Um, because that used to happen a lot back in the day. I remember I was in Dubai and I used to, you know, the hustle of driving around and painting the car and going oh, from man. house to house to house. And, you know, I would, it was a sweltering heat and there was this family, they live in the palms and she told me to come inside. She, you know, she, she knew my work. I, you know, showed everything there. I was there for a good hour, hour and a half going through my portfolio and she was going through my work. She was like, yeah, we love it, but... I'm thinking, can you do flowers? And I was oh, like, no. what the hell? I was like, no, I go, no I'm not going to do that. I was like, that's not <laughs> what I do. So um, I think that fear has definitely, I think that there was the fear and it's now given me the confidence, I think, to now kind of be free in doing what I want to do and take the work in the direction that I feel most comfortable in. Mm. And alhamdulillah, that's been received well by, by people. I mean, yes everyone has a specific ayat or a poem or something which is very personal to them. That I feel is the custom part, which for them, they know that painting is going to be unique to them. But then, you know, most of the time they'll, they'll ask me, you know, what colors do you think I should go for? Uh, what, you know, what else should I go in terms of, you know, stylization? So it, there's definite room for me 
to put my artistic touch, you know, into the piece. Um, so that trepidation is not there as much anymore. Of course, it's still there in terms of, you know, I, I want it to be as close to how they're imagining it. But I always tell them, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if you are commissioning an artist to do this, there has to be an element of artistic license in, in the piece as well. And, and trust me, you know, I'm not going to give you something, you know, horrible. You know the style of my work and yeah. inshallah, you know, it is going to be as close to yours with my touch as well. Otherwise, you could have gone to somebody else. Yeah, for sure. I think I think what's so important to remember um, whenever you kind of hire someone to 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 kind of, I guess, realize your vision ultimately you're not just hiring them because they can do calligraphy or they can paint or they can film or they can design you're mm-hmm. you're entrusting uh, your vision to them and, and to their vision right that that's what's so important it's, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I, I as you know i work in an office with salim and hasib as well <laughs> hasib does graphic design and some of the things i've seen <laughs> I, I just feel so sorry for him because i remember once he put his heart and soul into a logo and it was one of the best logos i've seen in my life and he showed it to the client and they're like, oh, let us just check with, you know, some of um, uh, uh, our trustees who are like 60 years and old and over. And they're like, no, we don't like it. We want to stick with the old rubbish logo. Um, and, and, and it's like, what do you kind of, you know, it's such, it's, 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 it's sometimes it's, it's a bit of a, it's, it's an awkward situation to be in sometimes, especially when you're starting off. And even I faced that uh, too in the beginning when I was starting like freelancing for clients, because it, it's like, at some point, you're just not bothered to argue anymore. Like, okay, whatever. I'll just, I'll just do whatever you want. You, know, you want to make it look like this for you? Just do it and, and pay me. I've, I've had enough. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it's really refreshing to hear that you've you've reached such a stage where, and and you know, I don't doubt it at all. You've reached such a stage where you know your 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 portfolio uh, is is strong enough um, that you know you can kind of guide uh, the conversation. But what, what what advice do you have for people who are in any artistic industry that are kind of starting off and have that tug of war when it comes to a client or, or someone who wants to who wants them to, to produce something for them? I mean, I, I think that's always going to be part of the journey. I don't think, um, I think for every artist, their goal is to, I mean, I, think, I say art, like a fine art artist like me, for example, their goal is whatever I produce, people just buy it. You know, like I'm only going to do my own stuff. And, you know, I, I, I always have this vision, you know, if you go to gallery gallery shows and, you know, um, there's not going to be an artist who's going to be there and be like, oh, do you want, I'll change the color for you or I'll change this for you. No, they'll just buy whatever it is. But um, I think now, you know, it's changed. The whole scene is not, it's not the same anymore. And, you know, clients want elements of them, their personality in the pieces as well or in, in projects and, and whatnot. But um, I think advice would be is to, kind of do what I did, which is, you know, do best of both. You know, I continued to do work for clients and everywhere I, where I felt and that comfortable enough to be like, oh, do you think this could work? You know, could this suggestion? And if it, if it was all shut down, then fine. Okay, you know what? You know, at the end of the day, it's also a business. So, yeah. you know, I'm not gonna just, I'm not, I'm not someone who's gonna say no, sorry, to keep your money. You know, if it's, a, if it's someone who's paying and they respect the, my value and they're prepared to pay, but they just want their vision, I'll do it. And on the on the side, I'll continue to do my own stuff. Mm. Um, I think I think there is scope to do both. I don't think you can do. I don't think you have to do either or. So I think for people, you know, be it graphic designers, be it photographers. I have photographer friends over here, who you know they want to do you know travel photography and you know product photography, but all they get are weddings. So you know, and they don't want to keep doing that. But I'm like, yeah. you know, what, just continue. You know, if, if it's paying and it's and it's still an element of creativity, then just do it. And then on the side, just do your other stuff. And you know, we have I think as freelancers. We, I, I say this for me, and I, I never, I don't ever complain. Oh, I have no more time. We have time. Like you know, we, you know, if, as, as busy as we are, as I felt that hard. Sorry, <laughs> I feel like I feel the same. There's days where I'm just like, oh God, I did nothing today. I was like so unproductive. But you know, I mean, there are days when I'm tackling so many different things, and you know, there's so many things outside of obviously just physically painting. You know, there's the business, there's the marketing, there's now Instagram. There's so many other elements that people ask me. So when you're not painting, what do you do? I'm like. There's so much other stuff to be doing. And, and part of that is also creating your own work aside from all of this. And I think, you know, if you can just manage your time and, you know, better and, and especially in the current times we're in, just everyone just wants content. Everybody just wants to see what everybody can do. So I think now is, if anything, the perfect time to do both. Um, and uh, if you're getting the projects from people, do them um, and do your own stuff at the same time. You know, it's um, very interesting. Sorry if I'm waffling. Man- no, way. please go for <laughs> it. No, no, it's, it's, We're here. It's amazing. We're, We're here, here for the rest yeah. of the night. This is it. This um, day's finished. <laughs> but I, I do want to go back to something you just said about how, as an artist, there's other, there's marketing, there's business, there's other aspects mm. of it. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you are an econ major. 
Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you are like, you're basically like me. We went into finance, you went into econ. Um, and, and, and as you know, a lot of artists struggle to understand that what they do at the end of the day is their business. It's how they yeah. make a living. Do you think that because you had that background or did that background help you in creating that business or did that just come out of trial and error because you were in the art world and then trying to make this into a business? Yeah, I'm going to be really honest and say my economic, my no, econ- I can't even say it. I can't even say it anymore. <laughs> that was so I've blocked out my memory. <laughs> exactly, right? Can you remember, like, I, went, I graduated in 2008 wow. um, and I went to Brunel. In, in, in Uxbridge. Fellow Bruno. Um, yep. I went there too. <laughs> you went to Bruno too? Yeah, I did. Um, I, I, I went so, for one year and dropped out, but I went there. <laughs> oh, what year were you there? <laughs> I was there. So this was around, actually, during my ABTV days. I was there 2011, I want to say, or 2012. Okay, yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, after old. I'm, I'm an old man. <laughs> um, no, but so I, 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 sorry, I, I did go quite late. So I, I, it wasn't like directly okay. after, after school. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, I honestly, I did that. I did that degree purely to take a box. At that time, you know, my, my, my father's an accountant, you know, brother's a doctor, sister's a teacher, right, right. Everybody, everybody's professional, mashallah. Um, <laughs> and I, I, you know, I had this desire to go and do, you know, I remember at the time at university, I said to my dad, you know, why can't I go and do drama or, you know, English literature or something? He was like, what? And I was just like, <laughs> okay, okay I'll, go, I'll go and do economics. So I did it, but honestly, no, I, that, did, that did nothing. And and even to this day, my father gets annoyed at me when I'm whenever, whenever you know you know my numbers and we're doing you know P and Ls and whatever my stuff. He's always like, "Other, oh, you have a degree in this." I go, "Dad, I haven't touched it in a year, a ten, a decade. I don't remember jack. I don't remember anything." Uh, I look back at my dissertation. It was like the GDP of India, economic growth, and I'm like, I, "Who wrote this? This is amazing. Whoever guy wrote this because I have zero idea what you're talking about." But what, like you said, it it really was trial and error. I think you know, graduating. And it's actually, my, I've only ever had a job in finance for two weeks and I got fired um, because I was just so bad. Uh, you want to hear that uh, story? Should we hear that story? <laughs> it, was, it was just horrendous. And it was actually Mehdi uh, who told me, he was like, Adam, why are you, you know, I know you've done that degree, but you're a creative person. Why do you, why are you continuing to do this? And I was like, well, I don't know what that is. There's no other option. I go, you know, I can't do anything else. He was like, well, there's marketing, there's PR, there's so many other things you could do. So I actually worked at Channel 4 in the beginning when I graduated, my first job as a marketing and PR assistant. Um, it was like a one week work experience that, and every day, you know, me and Mehdi would go home together in the train, he'd be like, what did you do? Who did you impress? Who did you network with? He's like, you have to stay on, you have to stay on. I was like, bloody hell. So every day that week, I tried to impress, impress. They kept me for another week. Then they kept me for a month. Then I did three months unpaid. That turned into like a six month stint. So, you know, it was one of those things. It was like the grind was there because I finally found something I kind of enjoyed. And that was when obviously all the economic, you know, economics, all those things kind of fizzled out for me. Right. Um, and when I was acting, obviously, you know, for those few years, it was purely thinking about the craft. I wasn't really thinking about from a business perspective. And then it was only when I started pursuing my art career, you know, officially. So I, my official start date from being a full-time artist was uh, February 4th, 2014. Hmm. So that was when I stopped like everything else, you know, uh, I had you know, a few jobs here and there just to kind of pay the way for me to go off to India or, you know, and Alhamdulillah, very blessed to have my father's support, you know, financially. He definitely helped me all the, along the way. But it was when I was 26, 27, he literally said to me, he goes, Adil, he goes, I love you, but you're, you're done. Like, you know, in terms of, in terms of I'm done, you're, I'm cutting, I'm cutting you off. Like, you're, you can pursue whatever you want to pursue. You can do whatever you want to do. You can live in my house rent free, but I'm not giving you any more money. I was like, oh shit. I was like, oh crap. Okay, fine. So, um, that is when, you know, I said to myself, like, you know, I need to turn this into a business because, you know, it's not, and prior to that, that's like, you know, when I first met, you know, Nuri, it was all hobbies. I had, I had stalls and you know, right. charity exhibitions and I was always like on the side and, you know, I, and I would say yes to anything. I would say yes to any project just to kind of get a bit of money so I could do something else with it but I really had to start formulating the business model myself and there's no blueprint for being an artist I think as even you know Nuri and you you, there's no set way of doing it I mean I used to get advice from so many people you know but at my end of the day I was like but they're like they're a dentist you know oh that's a business they don't know anything about art but yes they know from a business perspective so I I know their intentions are always correct but I was the one living the, living that life, right? I was the one going from house to house, literally painting with my car, driving around and taking it to people's houses. Um, and I really had to think to myself, okay, how can I make this sustainable? Like, you know, this is my only income and I don't get guaranteed income. And, you know, po- pre-COVID, 
and I think that's another reason why I moved to the US. You know, UK was a good market, but it was it, it's small. There's not as many people there. People are a bit more risk averse. You know, homes are smaller. People don't really want to commission big pieces. And then I moved over to Dubai thinking, okay, let's add that to the business plan. Let's go over there. It's Arabic. The Arab people make sense. But then I was like, no, it's oversaturated. There's so many people that do Arabic calligraphy. Right. I'd go around and they'd be like, what do you do? I was like, oh, I do calligraphy. Oh, another one. And I was like, <laughs> this is so wrong. It's just so bad. And one of my favorite artists, he's a French Tunisian guy called LC. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. You may, you may have heard of him. So he actually was the one that kind of coined the, the term calligraffiti, um, which was kind of merging graffiti and calligraphy and, and basically kind of just taking it away from its traditional form. And mm. it was his work that I saw and I was like, oh my God, I, could, I would love to do something like that because look, I'm not some insanely spiritual religious person who wants to you know, write you know, verses of the Quran in, in Duluth and you know, ha- you know, hardcore calligraphy. I'm also, uh, I just like, funky designs and patterns and beauty, you know, creating something beautiful and how can I do this with blending all these various facets so you know I, it, it's been very much trial and error there's been no right way of doing it I've done various projects thinking okay if I sell this much and if I price the work at this much okay worst case scenario this best case but honestly it's it's very much you don't you're not going to know until you actually do it um, and I think yeah. my only the only blessing I've had um, and I think I mean, I know everyone has grit and everyone has work ethic and all those things, and humble which is great. I think for me is I've been able to weather those storms of zero income for months and months and months on end. You know, that was purely because I was living at home, for example, back in 2015, 2016. Um, but then 2017, things started picking up. 2018, I moved over to the US. 2019 was one of my best years ever. Um, and then 2020, COVID. So it's, it's, it's one of those. But honestly, thank God for all that grind because this year or last year, I sold more paintings than I ever have during a pandemic. Mm, wow. And that's, that's purely, yeah. and I was freaking out. I was like, okay, who's going to buy art? Who's going to spend money on artwork during this time? Um, but Alhamdulillah, you know, I guess, you know, it's, it's a luxury good. And, you know, I, I, I have, I'm good at networking and I hustle and, you know, I, I, and it's so funny because everyone in my life, they know me that, you know, I obviously know how to chill, I can relax. But when I'm by myself, I'm, all I'm thinking about is, well, what can I do with my work? Where can I take it? Who, 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 can, who can I get in front of? And, and not do it in like a desperate way. Because I'm not, I'm, I'm not desperate, but I would just love for the work to get out there. I just feel like yeah. whoever sees it responds to it so well that it's not as if I have a hard sell. And it's not, it's not as if I have to say to somebody, oh, okay, I'll change that. But then will you like it? It's more like, look, this, you know, just show me, give me some, you know, FaceTime. So these are all the various thoughts. And that's all part, sorry, I know I'm waffling. And it's just no, funny, go for it, go for it. <laughs> it's, 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 this is all part of the business plan, the networking, the figuring things out, the trialing and error of collections. And do, I had to pivot purely online. Um, you know, like I said, and before COVID, and just to show you why I keep saying that, I think the definition of an artist is no longer this, you know, brooding, mysterious person that sits in a studio, comes out with a collection and a gallery just represents it and they're done. I mean, I, that's why I always thought, I always had this idea that I want to be in a gallery space, people serving d'oeuvres, walking around and I'm just like, oh yes, 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 and this, this, no. This, I went to this gallery in New York in March, just before COVID and, um, and I'm not going to mention the gallery, and I met with this curator. And uh, she was like, I think obviously she did a little bit of research before she met me. And then uh, she kept me waiting for 45 minutes. And I was like, okay, fine. Um, And then we sit there and she was like, oh, uh, congratulations on your success. I was like, okay, thank you. She was, I was looking at your Instagram and you're you're obviously you're doing very, very well. And I was like, I mean, okay, thanks. But you know, but I still would love, I go, I've never had like a really legit gallery exhibit you know where I have you know like my bio in, you know, embedded into the wall of a, <laughs> when you walk into a gallery and, and she was like so many clients can get in touch with you directly I was like yeah they can she was like and they can just talk to you they can like I was like yeah they can and she was like oh okay that's great she goes, see we only work with people that no one can get in touch with it, oh, it was like a roundabout way of saying oh so you're quite pedestrian wow. I was like okay or you know and then I walked out and I thought to myself you know what I don't know if I actually felt comfortable doing that. I actually feel more comfortable doing what I do in terms of with social media, with you know talking to clients, having you know a mixture of group shows, collaborations, private shows. I, I that's more me. And then collaborating in other things, you know, fashion, you know, beauty, jewel, all these various things. So for me, all these there's like I said, there's no set way of doing it. And my business model has many kind of prongs that come out of it. And I'm always figuring it out as I go along. So I get asked this a lot, you know, how do you turn into a business? It's, it's very much, you kind of have to just go along with the process. Okay. And, 
and just put and feel very you know uh, not shameless but just be very confident in your in your product and inshallah hope that people will respond um i don't know if that answers the question I it did it. <laughs> no. i think I, th- I think a lot of it comes down to really just and this is something that 2020 is kind of uh, this is my conclusion of 2020 which is just about understanding owning and living your truth I think yeah. that's what it is. You know, like you said, for example, I think so many artists would wish to be, you know, would, 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 would be in that same situation that you were in in that gallery and just be like, this is where I belong. But yeah. you kind of realize that, hey, that's not me. This, you know, is me. And, and I think that that's, I mean, I, I would say that is perhaps the reason why you become so successful is because you've understood your truth, you've owned your truth, and you are working with your truth, um, which yeah. I think is just so important uh, for any artist in any industry. Um, so much to unpack from what you said and uh, you Sorry. kind of delved into a, a, a lot of questions that we wanted to talk about. Um, I'm going to start with uh, your move to the US, which I think is, is, is quite an interesting conversation to have because I feel like British uh, Brits either love or hate the US. Uh, I'm, definitely, I'm definitely in a love relationship with the US. I'm back and forth all the time. I, uh, I think every year apart from last year, I spent about a month to two months in the US. I, I love being stateside. I love traveling in the US. Got so many friends there. Uh, I love, you know, th- there's so much I-, I love about it. When it comes to you and your move, uh, was there a culture shock for you uh, in terms of, you know, being an artist and just generally in terms of, you know, the the surroundings and society that you're moving into? And you know, I know you mentioned that there's more, uh, I guess, more, more capital in the US, more people to sell to, more, bigger houses, et cetera. Um, so how did it also uh, affect your business? I mean, I think, and don't get me wrong, you know, I miss home, I know, and, and because of COVID, I haven't been back, I haven't been in London since September 2019. You haven't missed anything, my parents. I, well, no, I, <laughs> I, I, I miss my parents, I miss my parents, I miss my siblings, everybody, but I think America, I, I used, to, used to travel here a lot as a, as a child, and, you know, we had a lot of family that moved from the UK to US, and I, I was always just kind of enamored by, you know, this American lifestyle of just, you know, grandeur and granted they all live in texas so you know it was it was one of those things where nice big houses I, exactly you know standard living is much cheaper um and it was just one of those things that i was always like how could i ever live there i don't think i could ever live there and, and honest honestly hand on my heart there was zero plan to move here or, or, or be based out of here for a period of time um because i genuinely thought london was always going to be it and you know i i the people in london like I said, as supportive as they were in my work, because that was where I got my first footing. And I'll, and I'll always be grateful for that and for the people who were patrons of my work in London and you know pushed me and introduced me to other people who then pushed me further. I mean, honestly, looking back, I've got where I've got, and I still have obviously a long way to go, but wherever I've got, it has been by the goodwill of people kind of introducing me, introducing me, introducing me. And that happened from London to Dubai, from Dubai to America. Um, and so when the opportunity came, to even just have like a small private show in America, I was like, yeah, let's do it, you know. And um, you know, and it was received so well. Um, people were like, oh, when are you back? And I was like, oh, no one's ever asked me when I'm coming back. <laughs> uncle, I was like, are you, back? Like, you want me to come back again? Um, and it was funny. It's so funny to say this, but all I had to do was just talk, and they were like, oh my god, you're so intelligent. I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> that is that. That is one reason I love America. <laughs> any any break can come off as smart. <laughs> I could just say, I would like some water. What did he say? Oh my God. <laughs> so uh, I was like, I just didn't have a no, no one in the UK is impressed by me, so I can just come in. So, um, and I think the, the, the clientele that, you know, being here, someone artist visa, um, and, you know, I, it has allowed me to basically, you know, base myself. So I'm based in the East Coast, and then I'm able to, like, you know, travel um, the US and like, a mixture of private shows, gallery shows. And I think, again, yes. People definitely have more, I said, disposable income over here. Um, you know, the, the, I think the type of people that moved here, the generation, if we're looking at comparable lists to UK clients and US clients, you know, people here definitely entered into the professions, you know, martial arts, you know, doctors, lawyers, accountants, and, and look, geography wise, London is just, you know, London. There's, there's so many, you know, hotspots to hit in the US just, just by nature of geography. Um, and, you know, I remember, and, and honestly, I will name drop him again, but Mehdi has definitely been a huge part of my life in terms of, you know, guiding me, introducing me to people. And, you know, uh, I kind of came here based off of his, you know, guidance and his recommendation. And then he kind of let me just, you know, flourish and meet whoever I needed to meet. Um, and it kind of snowballed from there. Um, and, you know, people in the US definitely have responded to my work positively. There's been a great breadth of 
you know, non-Muslims and Muslims appre appreciating my artwork. I think in the UK, again, I don't think I ever sold my work to a non-Muslim person. Whereas over here, you know, I've had a nice, a nice plethora of clients. I mean, it's been, it's been, that's, that's always been my goal. I mean, I love it when I get someone who messages me saying, we, we don't understand anything that you're writing, but it's so beautiful and we want it. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, that's a huge, that's a huge win. I think you know, my entire yeah, goal that, that's was- a, That's to, amazing. That was, a, that was a big goal because I feel like as soon as you see Arabic or you hear the word Arabic, you automatically just think, oh, okay, it's for Muslims or it's going to be quite intense and, you know, it, it's not for us. Um, and I think that's the kind of niche that I'm just trying to, you know, break into slowly and, you know, like, like Elseed and like now other artists to do variations of what I do. Um, you know, and it's, and it's so humbling to see other people copying my work now. And it, 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 it's crazy how that whole full cycle thing has happened. But America has definitely been the kind of great space for me to just, you know, grow, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, you wouldn't think but in places like Kentucky, Louisville, you know, Florida, Tampa, Atlanta. I mean, I've had some amazing, you know, private home exhibitions and you know, gallery shows and stuff. And the response is just so good. And, 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 I, don't, and I don't want to generalize and just say Americans, you know, are nicer or better than you know, UK people. No, um, maybe the weather's a bit better here. So that's why they're a little bit happier. Um, but, uh, I, I, like I said, I don't want to say that because I love UK. I, I, I'm, I'm born and raised there, and and I always know that's where I started. Um, but you know, America, and I'll say it back again, just by nature of you know the amount of Muslims who are here um, and how you know, mashallah, successful they are, and how they have this desire to want to be connected to something of their roots, but something which is still you know modern, abstract art, you know, artsy. Something which you know their their non-Muslim friends they ever invite them over, you know they can engage with the work in a more you know you know in in a in a different way as opposed to just you know hovering around you know, Muslims and Muslims all the time. Um, I just I just feel like it's 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 giving me as a, as a personal experience. Just being here has given me the opportunity to meet different types of people. Whereas in London it was kind of just the same type, and in Dubai it was again just the same type. Um, whereas here and also. And I'll say this, I've noticed this, the attitude of Americans is way more, oh, let's do it, let's give it a shot, let's try. Whereas in the UK, it was always like, well, even, even when I go, even when I speak to my dad, I'm just like, dad, why do you have to be so, let me just give it a shot, he's like, okay, chill, take it, give it a shot. But people here are like, people here don't really care about the outcome, it's like, yeah, let's do it, let's give it a shot. If it works, it works, if it doesn't, it doesn't. So, and I'm like that, I'm like, I don't want to have to like, you know, arduously think about something and pros and cons and this and that. It's just give it a shot. If it works, it works. Obviously do it with our best intention and, 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 and the best way. But yeah, I mean, that would, be, that would be my only gripe with the UK. Like UK are definitely, people there are a bit more like, mm -hmm, let's see, come back to me in like a year, uh, whatever. Whereas here, <laughs> here, uh, and especially in the West Coast, I mean, every time I've gone to LA and the vibe there is this, everybody wants to create, Love everybody it. wants yeah. Yeah. do stuff whereas you know and the east coast is a bit more serious i guess and with all the current situations of how things have been going um but again i have access to go i can you know it's easier for me to go fly down to the west coast than it would be from london or, and all that type of stuff so uh, that's been my experience i i definitely resonate with that uh, so much and hasnain don't get too happy that we're praising your two brits are praising your country <laughs> nah. um, exactly. but i i also just feel so awkward because i realize i'm wearing a, a new york uh, a yankees hat and i've also got an american flag right here as well um so <laughs> i just i feel like what am i do <laughs> i i i've sincerely misdressed for this and we, and we mentioned before before the podcast i remember like because you're you're already dressed up and Hastane's wearing a nice black t-shirt I'm just wearing like a, a bright lime green uh, hoodie I was like damn I, I wish you had changed um, but I, I resonate so much with what you're saying because even like personally I feel more free spirited when I go to America I feel like people are so much more free spirited more down to earth essentially more relaxed and I think I think a big part of that like you said is down to the geography and the reason I say that is because I was born and raised in deep in central London uh, and then I lived in Wembley for a while and then I kind of moved out to the outskirts, uh, which is where I live now. Um, and even here, like I realize people are more like relaxed and, and you know, more uh, just less wound up. I think I think that's what the city does to you. It really makes you wound up. You know, I, 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 I'll, there, there's there's a, a literal like, side by side comparison of when you go to Asda in Wembley compared to Asda uh, outside London. Um in Wembley, people are just so wound up and screw faced, and why are you looking at me? And you know, there's a whole kind of like frustrated Owl. vibe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you go outside and people, hey, how's it going? How's your day? People are just, you know, speaking. So I feel like geography is a big part of that. And and for me, like the second I moved out of London, my mind just like 
began to sue there was so much more space to breathe and and, and think which is what i get uh, in america too so in terms of hasnay it's not smiling i'm not talking about new york no. not, everywhere else apart from new york i'm from new york like, listen <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I- I love the air here, okay? New Yorkers, <laughs> born and raised have in New been, York, have I'm happy. To, have you been to the UK, Hustin? He came uh, I once. go quite often, actually, yeah. Oh, Did yeah, you? you? I thought you just What's, came in once. Yeah, I, I, no, I, I've been there five, six times. I have family in Cardiff. Okay. Um, um, but I go to the UK, which is funny because you guys are praising, like, <laughs> I know. Us, us here. But, but I love to go to Europe all the time. Like, I love to, like, go to the UK. And I don't know why that is, but I just, I, I don't know. I just feel like that, like, Europe is the hub of, like, art because, like, that's kind of where it became popularizing back in the days. And do, I don't know. Do, do you know what's funny and Adil, you, you resonate with this, you know, the first time you go to California as a Brit and you see the ocean on one side and mountains on the other. And, you know, I, I remember the first time I, I was driving with a friend, I was like, what's that? Are those clouds? He goes, no, those are mountains. I was like, are you just, are you just no. driving toward the mountains as if they're nothing? And you just, and what's funny is all my friends in LA want to move to London. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like and it, everyone in London wants to move to California. So I, I guess it's more, uh, you know, it's, it's that sense of it. Grass, grass is always greener, grass seems but... greener. Yeah, or you don't appreciate where you are, I guess. But uh, it is what but it is. I do but... miss. I miss. I miss the UK so much. I mean, you know, and I, and I you know, I can't wait to inshallah come back um, and, and and see what happens with the journey. I mean, you know, um, I, as I said, I never thought I'd be here for this length of time, and the time I've been here has been great. Um, and you know, I am obviously, I guess, as everyone is waiting for COVID to be over, to be yeah. kind of normal because right now, like I said, I've been doing all the stuff I could have technically done in the UK. I've just been painting right. in my apartment and just shipping my work to people. So, um, yeah, it's just it's the way the world is. Right now. Has your, I guess, kind of a weird question, but has your career process <clears throat> changed when you moved? I mean, does your environment kind of affect your career process or is it, does it not affect it at all? I, I mean, honestly, I, I feel like. And I, and I, again, hand on my heart, I'm, I, I, and I, I'm way more, what's the word? I'd rather just be authentic and just say, I'm not one of those artists that has to be in like a zone type thing. You know? okay. I mean, like I said, and I keep coming back to, you know, when I do my own collections, yes, that is when you know, I like to plan, I like to you know, you know, definitely kind of think creatively and come up with designs um, and, and compositions and whatnot. But when I'm doing client work, it's kind of, you know, I know what to get on with, you know, I, and, you know, for the last year, I've become a little bit more professional with graphic work as well. So I even send the client like a sketch as to how the painting is going to look. Once they've greenlit it, I literally just have to get on with it. It's just like a, there's not much creative process involved. So I'm not going to sit there and be like, oh, I need it to be sunny. And then, then, then I'll go downstairs. You know, I just kind of, you know, crack on with it like I would with any kind of project, you know, and, and just, you know, get on with it. But I think just being here, and, and knowing that I have options and I can do other things um, outside of the artwork. Um, you know, like I said, you know, I, last year or year before I did some clothing stuff, um, you know, there's plans to do some other kind of, you know, branch my work into other, you know, industries and stuff this year. I think that just excites me more. Um, and, you know, and it keeps coming back to, obviously, like I said, I love doing my, you know, canvas pieces and, you know, client pieces and, I think the onus falls on me to keep pushing and coming up with different ideas and designs so that my audience can be like, oh, because like I said, even work like this, you know, unless if artists like me didn't do this, people wouldn't know that Arabic could be manipulated you know, to fit these right. type of designs. So um, I just feel like this country has definitely enabled me to be a bit more creative, I think. Um, but I also, this could be due to the fact that you know, in the UK, I had more distractions. You know, I had my mm. entire family, I had my you know, friends, everybody there. I came here with literally Mehdi and that was kind of it. And now obviously I've kind of made my, you know, my little, you know, uh, circle. But I, I know, and no offense to all my friends and family who are in, in America, but you know, if I had it my way, I'd, 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 I'd want to keep in touch with my UK friends and my college friends. And, you know, I'd rather just get on crack on with my work here. I feel like I can definitely focus more on my work here um, and the business and the UK, it was, there were definitely more distractions and, you know, personal, professional kinds of things. So I can just crack on, really. Um, when it comes to um, your work, you work with a lot of uh, verses from the Holy Quran. Um, and mm-hmm. I, 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 again, like just scrolling through your Instagram, I just get, I've got it open right now, I just get so mesmerized, Marshall. Your work is absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Know, you know. There, honestly, there are no words to describe it. There's no point in me just Thank sitting here you. trying to blabble on. Um, but, <laughs> but, but I guess my question was uh, do you do you have, would you say you have like a, uh, I guess everyone has obviously a relationship with the Quran as well, but would you say you have an intimate relationship with the Holy Quran, a kind of special relationship? And would you say you need that to, 
uh, work on such designs or is it more like, you know, um, just kind of like discovering uh, pieces of the Quran as, as you go along? Um, I definitely think it's a very personal thing. I don't think I can sit here and say, you know, you need to have a relationship. No, I'm not going to, I'm not ever going to say that. I think for me, when I first started out painting, and this is back in, uh, I think 2007, 2008, uh, when I was just doing stuff for myself, um, it was very much, you know, like I said, my personal life was kind of reflecting in my work a lot back then as well. And I think, you know, like I said, I was in my twenties, figuring stuff out, you know, I would always, you know, go to the Quran and just try and find verses that would resonate around the themes of mercy forgiveness um because i don't know why i just used to always just feel like you know i don't know i could, I could be doing wrong things i might be going down the wrong path or just having these thoughts and i was like no let me just you know contemplate on these verses from the quran and and yeah most of my artwork the themes were generally around mercy forgiveness and gratitude um and just and and and, and showcasing the fact that you know we have so much to be thankful for and and patient, um, and, and and I think that patient theme is is always there. You know, there's always some. You know, recently I did a whole I did a piece for a client on Surah Al Asr. You know, all about sabr and patience, and the, and the right, client right. wanted it in the shape of an hourglass and sand kind of falling through. And you know, so those type of cool things it's, it's fun to do. But um, as time has progressed, um, you know, clients all come to me with specific verses from the Quran that resonate with them. There was a lady a few years ago. And I always say this story because it resonates. She used to recite, I think, verses or the entire Surah Maryam, for example, because um, she was trying to fall pregnant. Um, and I think for six, seven months, every day she would recite it. Um, this is after the doctors told her that she wouldn't be able to fall pregnant. Um, and then she was pregnant, had a girl, um, and then she wanted me to basically paint this one specific line from that. That you know, so that kind of interaction, that closeness with you know a client, and knowing that I'm able to provide some relief or some kind of beauty to their soul by putting up something in their home that will remind them of, a, of their own connection to the almighty. Um, you know, I've even, I get a lot of people who commission me to create work for people who've passed away, um, you know, in, in honor of their memory, um, be it a name or be it a verse. I mean, and last year, <laughs> I shouldn't say funny, but I think because of COVID, I had a lot of, um, you know, people were requesting, you know, verily with the hardship, there'll be ease and, uh, you know, uh, patience. Oh, I guess the current times everybody's in, I guess it all depends on what people, what, what people's mental state is at. Um, and then, you know, um, and it's when I do my own collections again, I guess that gives me the time to go back and ponder on, okay, now what do I want to talk about? You know, and I've now kind of moved on, not moved on, but added on to the Quran, poetry, you know, I did a lot of Rumi work. Um, you know, my most recent collection, which will be coming out soon, is all based in Urdu poetry. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough because my personality is one that kind of wants to do something and move on to the next thing. You know, I don't, I don't give myself the time to kind of sit and just, you know, be with a thought. I'm like, okay, done, forget, next, next. Um, and if anything, this is forcing me to actually, you know, actually take some time, read some books, reflect um and i and i think i can do that a bit more now because you know i alhamdulillah i'm in a, in, a, in a better place than i was a few years ago where it was literally just you know production 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 and you know now i can actually afford the time to sit there and you know and you know know that my clients will be there and alhamdulillah the orders are organically coming in and i have the products going on and um there's not so much of that ah uh, if i if i don't do this it's not going to work um so if anything and most recently actually i've actually my dad um sent me the study quran in English and nice. um, I'm actually making more of a point every night, even if it's for just 15, 10, 15 minutes, just sitting there reading it uh, with the commentary. Um, and I'm not saying that's inspiring me to go and create an art piece, no, but you know, I sometimes, I mean, the amount of Aytul Qurasis that I've done, the amount of nine, 10 names of Allah that I've done, you know, the amount of Sahabi Ay, Rabbi because you know, the rich then of the fables of the Lord, I've done so many of them. It's funny because people are like, oh, how do you contemplate when you paint? I'm like, sometimes I just, it's hard because I'm, I'm just, I, it's not always the same. I'm doing the same stuff over and over again. And, you know, that's why I want to do more of my own collections because that gives me the time to go and read, go and reflect, pick something that I resonate with. And I like to think others, others would too. And then I can get to kind of, you know, uh, make it beautiful and do it in a, in a, in a new kind of theme or style and, and whatnot. Um, but the, but the, the foundation of it is always going to be that, you know, it's, it's from a word of God or, or word right. or, or poetry. Um, that's, I kind of always want to stick to that realm. I don't want to, you know, like I've had people have said, come, you should do other stuff. And yeah, I've, I've, I've delved into other languages. I've done some stuff in Sanskrit. And actually most recently I've, I was doing painting for a client in Tamil. 
Um, I don't think it's in Punjabi. Um, and again, I, I do I enjoy that again because it's, it's it's typography. I mean, it's it's also the the manipulating text and doing all various things. And again, people come to me with text from there, from there, you know, from their sacred text that they mm. love. Um, and they would and they would rather have me do it. And they look past the fact that I'm a Muslim artist who's doing Arabic. So all these things I feel is such a blessing to be in a state where people from all walks of life and faiths and cultures come to me and ask me to do it for them. So it's it's all very humbling and all that. Right? You know, I, I don't I don't I mean I know I know you mentioned it and kind of alluded to it. I don't know what extent it kind of affects you, but me as as someone who writes poetry about the Albait, like you, that happens to me sometimes because because you do it so often, you kind of almost not forget how sacred it is, but like you forget, I guess the 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 purity of the art sometimes because you're just yeah. so used to it. you're doing it in day in and day out, right? Yeah. So I have some uh, like conversation with people like, oh, you know, this reminds me of this line when you wrote about this figure and said this. I'm like, did I write that? I don't even remember. <laughs> like, <know>? yeah. <laughs> yes, <I did. laughs> but it, it's like, because you're so, you, it, I think we kind of forget sometimes how much our work resonates with others and others and impacts others. And I think that's the beauty of, of art. And I, you know, when you, when you said that you were tasked with, uh, uh, you know, the, the story with that uh, uh, a sister who, who couldn't uh, have a child, you kind of reminded me of, of two poems that I, I, I was requested to, to write. One was a friend of mine who actually lost their child. And asked me to to to, to write a couplet uh, in memory of him, uh, comparing him to to, to Ali Asghar. Uh And oh, another wow. one uh, was uh, someone who asked me to write a, a couplet for the for the tombstone of her mother. Um, and it's like when you get those requests, you're like, okay, what I'm doing is serious now. I need to. This is serious. Exactly. It's like a reminder. Yeah. Hey, listen, what you're doing is responsibility. Yeah, it's a responsibility. It's not a joke, and you you need to appreciate that kind of. Um, I guess it kind of kicks you back into the purity of the art um which is something i guess you can kind of lose when you do it day in uh, and day out um but that kind of leads me to the next question which is the kind of standard question we ask all of our uh, uh, uh guests and, and including yourself what is a very broad question but i'm sure you have a great answer for it what is the relationship between uh, your art and your spirituality <laughs> <laughs> um oh God, now i'm like i don't know um <laughs> I mean, that's, it's, 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 it's a personal thought. It's a personal feeling. Um, I think for me, being spiritual is a very private, you know, act in itself. I mean, you know, I'm, I, you, you won't necessarily find me in, in, a, in a public place of worship, sitting there with a whole group of people. I would rather just sit in a corner, you know, do my, do my own thing um, at my own time. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't know, I've always found it always a little bit too, I can't concentrate, I can't be in a state of actual reflection if I'm too worried about, oh, I'm sitting cross legs and I can't, you know, I can't be comfortable right now and you know, all, all these various things. And I feel by nature of my work, like I said, I never set out to do this. It was always very much, I set out to do kind of, you know, abstract work and then it blended into Arabic. It, it kind of, in, in a good way, forced me to read more about the Quran and, and various ayats and various phrases and then delve deeper into potentially personalities who said those words, you know, Nahjul Balaga and all, the, all these various things. I, to be honest, I probably would have always taken it for granted prior uh, if I wasn't in this career, and if I was doing something else. Um, so I'm, I'm very lucky, my dad always said, he goes, you're so blessed that on a daily basis, you're, you're always, and, and coming back to what you said, I have to always remind myself of that because sometimes I can just be in that whole robotic mode and I'm like, damn, I'm actually writing words of Allah and, you know, um, and people, are, people are paying their hard earned money on me to create something beautiful for them that will then in turn remind them. Which is going to be so in their houses probably for generations to come. Yeah, exactly. And when my dad goes, you will get some art for that. I'm like, well, no, I don't, uh, I don't, let's, not go, let's not go there. And he's like, you know, you're going to be getting, you know, and, and it's funny, like even from a spiritual perspective, I'm, I feel obviously you can give money for charity and do all these things. And I feel I've just been, and, and again, I think before COVID, I was doing a lot of that. I was donating art pieces to organizations. I still always do that because I feel, Okay, yes, I can give my money. It's very easy just to give some money to someone. But if I can actually donate my time, my talent, my God-given talent, um, and raise money for causes and, you know, and, and, you know, propel other people's lives in any small way, I'd love to do that through my art. So even that, I feel, has some kind of spiritual energy going, you know, going on there. So there, there are various facets, I feel, how my art has affected me spiritually, how it affects other people spiritually. Um, I like to say... You know, I'm not a religious artist, you know, because I want the work to be available to everybody. You know, you don't have to be a, a person of faith to, to resonate 
with you know words from the Quran or words from the Bible or Torah or even the Bhagavad Gita or um, anywhere. So I feel it's one of those things that I'm very lucky that I'm in a field and I've kind of carved a little niche where you know it is a very universal kind of atmosphere and you know you can come from any background, have any kind of you know connection to Almighty or not. Um, and you know I, I feel I feel very lucky that I'm part of that experience as well. Um, and for me, I'd like to think, you know, and even for the times I do take it for granted, which I'm not being honest, I sometimes I probably do, um, you know, it's connecting me closer to God as well. Um, and then, yeah, and I'd like to think that for every person that looks at my that my piece, you know, I might get a bit of a bit of good points uh, <laughs> down the line. Um, and yeah, I feel very lucky that I can do this. And like I said, if, if it wasn't for the fact of, you know, and I hope inshallah with time, the whole business angle kind of just takes care of itself mm -hmm, and right. I can just, I can get on with just doing it. And I, and it definitely has. I mean, if I look back at the years, you know, like I said, I, I have more scope to be more thoughtful, to be more spiritual, um, to reflect, to contemplate now than I ever was before because I was so in the grind. And I think now I have other stuff I'm looking forward to doing. And, you know, I feel, I feel more confident. I, I, I always had this whole imposter syndrome. I was like, I'm not half as of the Quran. I don't even speak Arabic. I mean, you know, I, it's English. My parents are from India. I speak barely blame Urdu um, and you know it's just like should I even be doing this I, I would exhibit in Dubai and people would be like oh, Adil, I'll be like <laughs> yes and they're like they're like could you could you like read what you've written I'm like well I can say it in English to you quite nicely and they're like do I speak Arabic I'm like no they're like well why are you doing it then? I was like oh shit I was like maybe I shouldn't even be doing this I go you know but I was like wait I mean I grew up reading the Quran I mean you know Arabic yes it's not my first language but I've always had a connection to it it's, you know we grew up reading it we right. recite it every day in our namaz so my 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 connection to it has always been there so I never felt comfortable when people kind of took ownership of it and it was like, it's art you can't have it because you're British Indian mm -hmm. I was like you know what no I'm going to take it and I'm going to do something with it be respectful to it throughout obviously which I am always I mean you know People, I'm, I'm, I, I try my hardest to always be in a state of a zoo when I paint. Um, you know, I start every piece with, you know, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim before I start. I make a niyat in my head. Um, you know, yes, there could be a podcast or even maybe music in the background. But, you know, I'm not playing it to be all like, you know, ah, screw this. It's, it's purely just to kind of get me more into a zone so that I can create, inshallah, you know, a beautiful piece of investable art for people. Hmm. Um, that's kind of my only goal right now. So I don't know if that answers the question. Honestly, I feel like I'm just waffling this entire hour. No, honestly, it's, <laughs> this is great. It's great. Me, me and Hassan are just quiet because you know you, you're spending so much wisdom and you know we're just spending no, so much. No, um, no, cool. the, yeah. There is one thing, Hassan. I'll, I'll, I'll let you jump in because I feel like I've, I've taken taken over and taken from your from from your light. But, but before before I let well, you I'm jump tried. in, before I let you jump in. Um, <clears throat> There is kind of one thing that we haven't kind of mentioned. I know your dad mentioned, for example, and you mentioned, you know, getting thawab. Uh, and sometimes I guess we can look at uh, things in, dare I say, this a bit of a transactional way. I, I know some people kind of see things like that. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get a bit of thawab. For me, like, and this is just kind of like the way I, I work when I try and try and do something good. It's like I try and take the thawab out of my head. It's not about the thawab. It's, it's, yeah. I'm just doing something good because goodness isn't like, Oh, five points or six points or ten points. Goodness is like a flow of energy, right? It's just you know you're part of the good vibes and 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 and, and you're spreading good. And I think one thing that's amazing about your 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 art and and maybe one thing that one thing we haven't kind of talked about on this on this episode is that once you produce something and give it to someone and it, and it, and 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 it finds its home, be it paid for or or be it a, a gifted or be it something you've created as a passion project, it will inspire people to do good. Right, and I think that's what's so beautiful about it. Like you having you hang it up in your home, and and you know whoever's home it is, um, whoever owns the home, every time they look at it, they're inspired perhaps to get closer to God. Then their children see it, and they're inspired perhaps to do something. Then their children see it, and they're inspired. So it's almost you know it, it's almost timeless in the in the sense that um, I mean it, it's just so amazing how much of an impact it can have just as something so kind of, you know, simple, or not, not simple, yeah. but it's, it's on a, a canvas. Stoic it, object. Yeah, yeah. A stoic object. A stoic object. I'm trying to look for the right words. I didn't <laughs> want to say, oh, your artwork is very simple. No, no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> no, no, really. <laughs> you know, it's, it, 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 it's, a, it's a physical object that kind of stays in place and it, it, it generates ideas. It generates energy. It generates emotion, which I think is absolutely, um, you know, uh, incredible. Hasnain, any uh, parting words? Uh, no, I just, um, I, I had a thought in my head um one of my other friends mentioned how, because you mentioned early how uh, you did Arabic. That's kind of how you started. And then now you're dabbling into Urdu. Um, I, I know you do a little bit of Farsi and then you had some Punjabi and this, that, and the other. Yeah. 
um because i know a lot of people assume the, for the common person oh if you can do arabic or do in farsi it should be easy because they're kind of the same and i tell them as somebody who's not a calligrapher <laughs> not a calligrapher uh for the audience who's, who's thinking about that like was there a learning curve to be like, okay, I've done Arabic for a while. Now I'm doing Urdu. Now I have to change up the way my strokes are. I have to change up the way my process is because it's not the same. It's, it's you know, some people might say it's more difficult to do that. Or mm. some say it's, it's simpler. What, what's your thought on that? I mean, I think with Arabic, I think with the years, I've got a bit more confidence in knowing where and how much I can kind of push, push the boundary right. a little bit. You know, like, you know, when I initially did the traditional style of Arabic, then you've got this kind of more, you know, abstract i call it i mean I, i've kind of moved away from the word calligraphy t if anything it's more like a ribbon style calligraphy where the alif instead of just being straight it will like blend, bend and flow and there's kind of you don't know where it starts or where it finishes and right. you know i get clients who are like oh i can't really read it i'm like well, what's the point i mean it's, it's, it's art i mean you know it's it's there i always send the client the picture of where the eye actually is i'll be like there can you see the fur there you can see the fur and then, then it kind of gets lost um and then when i do other languages that's a little bit more challenging and that I, I feel like I have to be a little bit more in touch with the person who's commissioning some work like that and ask them is it okay if I elongate the line at the top because Sanskrit has that line that goes all the way right, on top right. for example and, and Urdu as well it's very much it's, the, the letters don't have much of a finish it's all very kind of more like you know I don't know what the word is for that just a bit more I just feel like they haven't got like an end to them so mm -hmm. for me it's you know there's an Arabic it's a bit more clean cut stuff um, so it kind of falls into the you know, can I be a little bit more artistic and and make all these languages like my own style, or do I actually pay homage to the way they actually are supposed to be done? Right. Um, Arabic is the only one, obviously, with years of doing it, I feel more confident in this. Leave it with me; I can take care of it. But even like, for example, this piece for this Tamil client, I will check back in with them and be like, "Look, I've done this. Is that okay? Is that respectful? Uh, can you read it enough? Um, uh, does it mean? Does it, does it mean what it says?" Because obviously, if I if, in, other, in those other languages, a small influx could change the meaning completely, uh, right. like a, you know, and, and all these things. So, but I think the Arabic has definitely helped me get to that point where I, I pretty much know, okay, this is pushing it too far, or you know, this is I can get away with this. This is still falling in the realm of artistic, um, and they're going to be chill with it because you know they they you know, they know my style and they know my kind of aesthetic. Um, but I, I feel it's been very, I've been lucky to kind of. I get from someone who doesn't speak Arabic and you know it is very basic right. in terms of the reading and writing. I feel very lucky that other people, other languages, people come to me and they're like, "Yeah, can you, can you do your own take on it?" You know, and and blending when they want Arabic and Sanskrit. Like I'm doing a piece actually for another client, and it's uh, it's in the Gurmukhi script. But she was like, well, "We want um, love, peace, and happiness written in Arabic in your style behind, but our thing on the front." And I was like, "Oh, cool, amazing, let's do it." I was like, "You know, why not?" So yeah. all of them is just like a win-win-win. <laughs> So based on all the pieces you've done mm -hmm. um, and, and the different languages you have done, what was your most challenging piece and what was your most proudest piece? <laughs> I've, done so many. I've done so many. Um, I think uh, any, I think some of the ones where I do the, the Sufi dervishes and, and I did this kind of lady in those are great. Where, I love those. Yeah, yeah those are amazing. Trying to capture movement in a still piece from someone who's not a trained artist, you know, I'm not, you know, I've never I've done any kind of schooling. Um, you know, the, the typography is much more, I'm more comfortable in that realm, including imagery is always challenging a little bit for me. Um, and sometimes a little bit frustrating because I'm like, why isn't it looking exactly like that? It needs to look exactly like, you know, the, what I want to look like. But so creating movement is tough. But, and also um, I love doing doorway, like, you know, um, you know, the Moroccan doors, the en entrances to, you know, creating like a 3D kind of look in a piece. And I've been exper experimenting more with charcoals and, and pastels and, and pencil sketching. Um, I mean, like I said, I, got, I get people who want me to do portraiture work. And technically, yes, I could do that. But do I really want to do that? Not really. I'd rather kind of stick with the kind of stuff that I feel comfortable doing. But I, I have a piece again coming up, which is going to be based off another challenging piece, but the client wants it in a six foot format. So I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be intense. It's going to be like a three archway piece with the nine surnames of Allah in calligraphy wow. on the archways with a 3D effect in each arch. So any, well, those are the ones that are the most- You, you lost me. I don't, I don't even know what was, <laughs> arch, 3D, <laughs> I, I, just, okay. I, 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 I was just calculating how long that was gonna take and it just gave me anxiety. Uh, no, no, about no, it. no. It's, 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 it's stuff that takes me away from, I guess, like my, my kind of you know, traditional style is. Right. Um, and, and I love that because it's challenging. Um, and it also kind of, gives people the option of, okay, you can also, you can add that to your repertoire as well. 
Um, but I'm not going to sit here and say yeah, I'm a portrait artist or you know, I'm an impressionist artist. No, I mean, first and foremost is typography. Um, and I will do my best to incorporate other other forms in it. Um, it. So, yeah. And your most, most proudest piece, you didn't, you, didn't, you didn't mention that. Honestly, and it's in my sound really name, but I think it's probably, probably going to be the first hardcore intricate piece I ever did back in... 2011 i think mm -hmm. it was oh, a, it was a sort it was yeah it was a sort of class piece it came out of a time when i was in a really rough period of my life and it was a pretty dark piece um but i it was a big one and i i had no studio i literally did it in my in our, in our guest bedroom downstairs in my parents home on the floor put like an old chart in a uh, sheet out <laughs> and i just painted it on the wooden floor with a little cushion for my knees um and it was honestly one of those pieces that i had didn't really think much about it um, and I just did it and, and I put up in the house. And then honestly, from that, it's kind of what got people going in terms of the, everyone thought my parents bought it from somewhere and they were like, Oh no, I, I love that. And I was just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, but then they were like, no, no, this is, this is amazing. And I was like, what, you like it? So that piece will always have a special piece, a special place for me because I know what my intention was while making it. And it was purely just, I wanted to create something because I was going through something. Um, and then for that to have resonated with people um, and it opened up an entire career, which honestly, like I said, I keep going back to it. There was no desire to be an artist. There was no desire to do this, you know, to do this work in the beginning. And now that it's been handed to me and I'm doing it, I know, I hope inshallah it never goes away like now, which like, you know, <laughs> I hope inshallah I can continue to create. More power to you, bro. More power to you. Thank you. Um, thank you guys so much. It's no, so thank much. you for coming on. Just want to take this moment to, to really appreciate you and your fantastic work. Um, if anyone wants to reach out to you or, or, or see your work, where can they find you online? Instagram, I guess, is probably the best place. I mean, that's, my, my, that's where my portfolio is. I have a website as well, otherlovely.com. Um, but yes, I'm one of those approachable artists, so you can visit <laughs> me. 